afternoon. Um, uh, I'm talking about satin leaf today. Um, and one of the reasons I'm, I, I'm studying this plant is I'm a Florida native. Went, got a master's in Georgia. Got a PhD in Virginia. And I was like, come hell or high water, I'm coming back to Florida. It's, uh, you know, Georgia's a southern state, Virginia's a southern state, <coughs> kind of. I just can't handle gray winters, you know, for five months straight. I just had to come back to Florida. And so when I got back to Florida, you know, I got a job with um, the Florida Forest Service and became a biologist for Picking and Strand State Forest and the OK Slough State Forest. And when I saw satin leaf in the OK Slough Forest, I was like, I don't know much about it. I remember seeing it 15 years before. I was like, let me read up on it. And I was really amazed at how little there is published about satin leaf in the scientific literature or just even just sort of about its biology. So when I have free time here and there, when I go to Okie Slough, I just sort of take a look at it. I really wanted to sort of know more about its biology. All right. So just to introduce you to it, and for those who don't know it, uh, Fancy scientific name, Chrysophyllum oliviforme. Um, it's in the family of Sapindaceae. Um, basically, it's a little subtropical mid story tree. Um, it occurs in southern Florida, part, parts of the Caribbean, and I think even into Central America, so maybe far south of this Honduras. Um, it's got these dark green, glossy leaves on top. It looks like a ficus hedge you might have in your house as a house plant. But on the bottom side, it's got this really striking sort of dense copper-colored pubescence. It's really coppery-colored, uh, so it's pretty neat looking. Um, and if you damage that leaf, like you turn the leaf off the growing you know, branch, it makes a latex. This white latex comes out, like if you damage a dandelion plant or a milkweed. Um, it, it produces numerous flowers in the leaf axles of the current season's growth. So as a branch is elongating, before that branch becomes woody, um, flowers are born in the leaf axles, and they're fairly small, and I'll be talking about those in a bit. The fruits look basically like little olives, um, and they're born from the leaf axles from a successfully pollinated flower. Uh, and again, like finding that there's not much written about these guys, um, and doing some graduate work in the past on sort of pollination biology, I was sort of wondering, well, when does these things even flower and set fruit? Like, I didn't even really know that, other than, in fact, I think one, I think IFAS publication says it flowers from June to November, which I was like, well, that's five of 12 months. That's pretty wide, you know? Does one individual flower the whole five months, or is it a tree here and a tree there over that time? Just what is the sort of you know, phenology of flowering and fruiting, and sort of roughly, you know, how synchronous is it amongst individuals, say, in a population? And, you know, having some prior experience in pollination biology, I wondered, you know, what pollinates it. I, I didn't even know if it was wind pollinator or not, or does it have to be pollinated by an animal vector? Um, and I don't know anything about its pollination biology. Like, is it self compatible? Can pollen be moved within the tree and then make fruit, or is it obliquely outcrossing? Requiring a pollinator to do that. And like, you know, mostly I had some sense of where you can find satin leaf in South Florida, but I don't know its, you know, biology extensively. So these are some of the things I really wanted to, I want to know over time. For the purposes of this talk, I'm only going to talk about sort of the reproduction of it. Mostly because I only have 20 minutes. Secondly, I don't know much more about these than I did two years ago when I first started this. All right. So to give you an idea of reproduction, um, here's the you know leaves of satin leaf, and in the leaf axle is the you know is where the flowers are born. So this is roughly mid June. <clears throat> this white tag is a jewelry tag you can get like at Office Max or Office Depot. It may be at most a quarter inch by a half inch. So what I want you to get is that these flowers. Flower buds at this point in time are incredibly small. I mean, they're, the heads of pins are bigger than this thing. But nonetheless, by mid June, you can usually determine if a satin leaf is going to make flowers or not, in order to under flowering. The long bud like thing here is, I guess, like the dormant vegetative bud. So, next growing season, a branch will start to grow out from here. So, 
Keep in mind, though, in, in mid-June, a lot of these flower buds are smaller than that terminal vegetative bud that will start next year. But you come back in mid-August, so roughly two months later, and these flower buds have long since elongated past the, the dormant vegetative bud there. So the flower stalks are growing, they're elongating, you know, you know, reproduction is underway. But we have no open flowers here. Otherwise, this is a slow progression, slow growth of the floral structures out, you know, growing. And so to sort of really sort of determine what the phenology of flowering is in this, in the inferring in this species is, um, I've been mapping the satin leaf that I'm finding on the OK Slew State Forest, which I forgot to put the slide in for that, but that's sort of north of Big Cypress here. The water from the OK Slew State Forest does flow generally southward into Big Cypress here. It's sort of in the dead center of Henry County, so it's a it's a it's a underutilized forest in a very remote county, in the most remote part of the county. But for roughly the 70-something satin leaves I know of in the forest, I chose to look at just eight which are on a trail. Um, so they, they can conveniently be census in a half day. And I did this from mid, you know, roughly mid-June of last year to February of this year. I think the title I sent Jim says, two-year flowering phenology and for flowering and fruiting. This talk is one year because when I looked at the data for this year, I realized I don't really have enough points to make a nice line. It's, it's like three points. You know, that's not much of a trend, so to speak. So this is really just data from last year. Uh, but on each individual satin leaf tree, I looked at three to ten flower clusters. Like otherwise, I tagged them and repeatedly visited them on censuses over time. <clears throat> Mostly, I did ten per tree. Um, one constraint I have is I can only sense this flowers I can sort of physically reach up and touch. So anything flowering above eight feet in height, I can't reach. I didn't bother to tag. A lot of these places you have to cross through wetlands to get to them. I can't drag a ladder with me. Even if I was ambitious enough to drag a ladder, I don't have a tree sturdy enough to put the ladder against the climate because satin leaf tree trunks, you know, have a you know diameter of breast height about like that. So. I would collapse a tree to even try to look higher in the canopy. So one constraint is these are the flowers that are, you know, seven feet or lower for the most part. So it may not be representative of flowering throughout the whole tree. All right. But at each flower cluster, at each census, I basically sort of said what stage of floral or fruit development is this cluster undergoing? And also, I just wanted to check how many fruits are actually being developed, you know, over time. So, not knowing anything about this plant, I just sort of had to make terms up in the field. So, on my visit in June, I just said, okay, well, these are in bud, meaning I don't even see corolla tissue yet. It's just literally a floral bud. And then, you know, two months later, in mid August, I started seeing this where I would say a broke bud. Um, you can see some green corolla tissue through the uh, sort of copper pubescent uh, calyce. So earlier, you see no corolla tissue, but this thing's sort of cracking in half. And you can start to see what will be the flower eventually, and it's sort of green colored at first. So that's broke, but it basically it means the, the, the two copper scales have popped open, but the corolla tissue has not projected beyond those coppery scales. Whereas what you see here and here, the corolla tissue is expanding with water and it's going sort of beyond the bud, it's actually actively expanding. Likewise, on these, you can sort of see the five white lines where the flower is going to pop open, it's going to show its five petals there. Those are sort of the suture lines. So that's sort of the third stage that's beyond the bud. Next is flowering. Um, once the flower opens, it has more of a yellowy green tint to the corolla petals there. Um, Five stamens born on the center of the petals near the base. Styles in the middle of the flower. Um, it's something the literature didn't say at all, is that apparently all flowers are hermaphroditic. You have both male and female function in all flowers from what I can tell. Um, I don't know exactly how long the flowers stay open, but my guess is it's not more than about three days. Because on my census, like, the shortest interval from between visits was about six days. 
And I would have flowers go from this stage to that, which is the next stage where the, where the corolla has fell off, but the styles are still persistent, and those coppery scales sort of shut back around the ovary and the surrounding tissue there. So again, I think it's fairly short-lived flower, about maybe three days, it could be as four, or maybe two, that I don't know for sure. All right. But these are some of the five stages of flowering. All right. Um, at some point, if you return, you'll have a small green fruit so that you can still see the style stuck on the end of it there, but they've sort of shrunk in size. And then later on, the fruits are much larger, um, but still that green color. And then on the last visit, when I went to take photos, camera didn't work. <laughs> But the fruits are black, I trust you. They, they're just not that big. But, you know, you'll be seeing this picture again in the talk. <laughs> so, all right, here's just basic data on the flowering of satin leaf. Um, this is probably the first talk I've ever given where I don't have statistics in it because I don't think I have enough data, or I actually, I don't even have a hypothesis to test for statistics. But what's interesting about these flower clusters is. You know, it's rarely you ever have a single flower in a flower cluster. Usually there's some number of them, all right? And so these are my eight satin leaf trees here. And just something to sort of take away is the black dot is the average number of flowers in a cluster on a tree, all right? So amongst the 10 flower clusters I checked on this tree, on average there are about six per cluster. And there was a low of two and a high of 10 in any one flower cluster. Now those are the 10 I measured, you know. If we're talking 20 feet up in the canopy, who knows what it is, I, but I suspect it's not terribly different than this spread here, just from what I can see on the ground. And there's some variation amongst the trees for how many flowers are actually gonna cluster at any one point, okay? And what's interesting is that the average points tend to fall roughly within the middle of the range, so it seems like the number of flowers in a cluster is rather normally distributed. You know, maybe with the exception of this guy here, which had a tree fall on it, it's growing up. It's growing very awkwardly, to say the least. So on my first visit in mid-June, the flower buds had a long had formed but not really elongated. Otherwise there are still these tiny little floral structures down in the leaf axle. But by mid-July, um, Flowering had commenced slowly during, uh, I guess, the period between mid-June and, say, mid-August. But from mid-August to mid-September, that that the, the further stages of flower development occur rather rapidly. Right. So, on the x-axis here, I've got dates. So that you know, this is month and day. So it's June 29th through uh, September 15th here for last year. The boxes in between indicate how many days span between the actual census events. And you can see that there was a big gap here where I was just busy doing other things and couldn't get back out here. But I don't want you to really focus on the separate lines here. Those are just tracking the different trees. What I want you to sort of focus on is the, the sort of median stage of fruit development. So for all those flowers that I checked on my satin leaf trees, for the most part, they were all in this early bud stage in mid-June, all right? Nine days later, there's hardly any real development at all throughout these satin leaf trees. Otherwise, it's still very much in that very first stage of sort of flower production. Um, and then even into mid-July, not much development is occurring, just this slow elongation, all right? Skip 41 days later, so more than a month, um, it's in this stage here where the corolla tissue is just starting to expand and it breaks those sort of calyx scales open there, but nowhere near opening yet. Uh, but I decided that, well, because I can see the corolla, I should get back out there as soon as I can, and it was ended up being about two weeks. But in this 13-day time span, so from mid late August to sort of early September, I went from this stage here where the corolla tissues are barely just starting to expand to like many of the satin leaves, more than about half the flowers had already bloomed and the corolla fell off. And the other half of the 
flowers are, or roughly, you know, a lot of the flowers are at this stage here, like the corollas are fully expanded and they're just about to pop open. So I sort of caught it right at the middle of that flowering stage there. Okay. And then just, you know, a little over a week later, I go back out. Almost all my satiny trees had finished flowering. And they're at this stage right here where pollination has occurred, pollen tubes have grown down the styles, and the ovary has likely been fertilized. Okay. Except for a couple of straggler plants here. Uh, one's in dense shade with a red bay fell on it, it's growing awkwardly. This one's in full sunshine. I don't, I can't really say why these two things are different than the others. They just are. And as far as the, you know, tracking fruiting, um, I didn't just do the other activities I had to do. I wasn't able to check on these as frequently as I wanted. But if I sort of go back a slide. So this census was sort of mid-September. I wasn't able to go out again until sort of mid-November, so about two months later. Um, in mid-September, in mid the average flower state was just at, you know, the stage five here where almost all the corollas had fell off. Fertilization had occurred and fruits are probably just now getting started. So in mid-September, we are at this stage here where, sorry, mid-November, where the fruits are now just starting to grow. And you can clearly see which flowers actually were fertilized and which ones weren't because when a flower is not fertilized, well, you know, some week to six weeks later, if you, if you touch it, it just falls off. You know, it just sort of, you know, slews right off. Whereas those that are fertilized, they're still green and viable and will stay there. Um, you know, came out in early January. Um, a lot of immature fruit still. Some are roughly small in size and some are larger. Like they've basically attained their full size, but not really any mature fruits yet. All right. I come back out in late February, um, and there's a lot of green immature fruits, but not many mature fruits yet. Uh, and I should have, there's a caveat on the way I take, took this data. Um, it's like here I can see a large green fruit at this date, but on this date, there's not a fruit where it was, you know, those days before. So I don't know if it matured, got dispersed, or if a branch in a windstorm or wind, you know, knocked it off. I don't know what the fate of that fruit was. I don't know if it matured and was successfully dispersed or if it just got damaged in some way. So I can't account for that absence, but it seems like the the maturation of fruit is a lot slower than what that pulse of flowering is. Um, something else I noticed out there was I was trying to observe what animals I saw with the satin leaf because I was looking for pollinators, which I never saw, by the way. I absolutely saw no pollination event. But um, I did see this. I saw some of these green fruits with a little dab of latex here. If you damage the fruit like you would the leaf, the latex will come out. And it ended up being this, um, not a beetle, I think that's a hemipterin. Um, I collected some specimens of it and sent it to uh, the Forest Service's forest health, forest health section in Gainesville where they identified forest pathogens. And our guy was pretty sure he knew what it was right away, but he sent it to plant industry. And it ends up being this uh, musops bug here, which had not been documented in Henry County before. Um, this bug is native, um, but it got named for the plant it damages in the Miami-Dade area, which is a non-native Minnesota plant. I guess it's used in landscaping. Uh, this is not a specialist on satin leaf, but it is a specialist on things in that family. So the whole Sapindaceae family, which make a lot of make fruits similar to this, you know. So this bug is a specialist on that family. So that's now known to occur in Henry County. Um, in a nutshell, I basically told you all I've learned about satin leaf, you know, in one year's data. Um, but I still want to address these questions here, like, um, based on the flower shape, I don't think it has a specialist pollinator. I think it's a generalist pollinator. It's probably some nice busy moth. It could be a host of small insects. Uh, and I suspect I would have to be out there at night possibly to see um, pollination occurring. 
I suspect these flowers also open late afternoon or evening, and it's probably night visited for sure, but I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, I'm currently sort of mapping this out. I tend to find satin leaf in more tropical type hammocks where you start seeing gumbo limbo, a lot more mersiney, uh, stuff like that. And so I'm mapping that out in the OK Slew Forest, and I plan to do that at 15 Strand State Forest as well. Satin leaf's on our species list, but I have not seen it out there, but I think it's somewhere I just haven't been. With that, I want to thank my supervisor, Kevin, for sort of letting me have free time to go do that when I, as I can fit in my schedule. Uh, Jeff Heitwerk for helping to ID this bug that I sent to him. And then Chris Schmiege, the sort of forester, who sort of has an administrative role out in the state forest for helping me at times too, you know, like getting your truck stuck at 4 o'clock on a Friday. You know, that does not not something good to happen when you work for any sort of state or federal agency. <laughs> and with that, uh, thank you, and I'll take any questions, guys.